Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Isn't it exciting listening to all these Christmas songs? All the color around and the families about to get together. MasterCards bulging at the seams. Would it surprise you that uh, if you got to see uh, Peter or John or Matthew or Paul and you asked them, what do you think about Christmas? And they would say, I beg your pardon? I think we sometimes think that this was all, you know, there was, uh, there was uh, twinkling lights and uh, tinsel all around the manger. <laughs> no, it was a stable and there was something else all around the manger. It was stinking, not very hygienic. Was it a real glittery night? They were there because of the IRS summons. The only reason they were even there, right? Would you be very happy about being drug 80 miles south to pay a tax with a wife completely pregnant? It was not as glittery in reality as we have made it. As all things, human beings have the tendency to forget the bad and accentuate the good. And what we've done around these nativity narratives in our Gospels is to cloud them in mist and wonder and sparkle and cultural festivity. And I think sometimes we forget what the real purpose of all these accounts are. Now think with me for a minute. There's four Gospels. One of them begins the uh, story of Christ from back in eternity, before the creation of the world, and then moves very quickly to the experience with John the Baptist. That, of course, is the gospel according to John. Last gospel written. First gospel, Mark, doesn't even talk about the birth of Christ at all, but moves immediately into Jesus' baptism. So John the Baptist is on the stage in chapter 1 in Mark. It is only in Matthew and Luke that we have something of the early accounts of Jesus' life. And the question always comes back, why do you think these gospel writers included the little bit of information that they did about this very, very significant incarnation of God in human flesh. And that's what I want to talk with you a little bit about. This is going to be a little bit different uh, Christmas message because I really want to combine these two gospel accounts and to try to see a little bit behind the purpose of them instead of just what's so familiar with us and that's the basic accounts themselves. Now think me for a minute. Are the gospels written to give us a complete history of the life of Christ? Of course they're not. They're not a complete history at all. Even all four of them put together are not a complete history. They're not even a chronological history. They don't even give us all of the significant teachings of Jesus. I think Jesus said a lot more on many different subjects than we have recorded in the Bible. Well, what was the criteria then for deciding what was recorded and what was not recorded? Obviously, all the words of Christ were very significant and helped men understand how to live. Why weren't all the sayings of Jesus recorded? Matter of fact, there are several times in the writings of Paul and Peter when they say, and you know that Jesus said, and they make a little statement, and we have no idea from where he said that. It's not recorded anywhere in the gospel account. I want you to think with me for a minute. Behind every one of the Gospels is a target audience. Behind every one of the Gospels is a purpose. 
who was Matthew trying to reach? Well, Matthew is that gospel that has more Old Testament quotes than any other gospel. It explains less about Jewish feasts, Jewish events, Jewish happenings, but it has more Old Testament quotes. So who would you think that Matthew would be written to? Obviously Jews. Who knew about Jerusalem, who knew about the Jewish feast days, but who really needed to be encouraged from the Old Testament that this was predicted, that Jesus was the coming one, that this was in the predetermined plan of God that had been unfolding since the call of Abraham. That is why... If you look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, when you look, it's the genealogy, of course. And the genealogy goes back to Abraham through David. And the main characters are Abraham and David and then Jesus. But if you come to Luke, the genealogy is not found until chapter 3. But the last verse of chapter 3 takes the uh, lineage of Jesus all the way back to Adam. Now, why would Matthew go only back to Abraham, but Luke go all the way back to Adam? Well, if you've read chapter 1, you know exactly why. Luke is writing to a man named Theophilus. And he wrote two books to Theophilus, the Gospel of Luke and Acts. And he wrote to this uh, obviously Greek, Obviously very wealthy, knowledgeable man. Some of us even think maybe Theophilus paid for the writing and the production of Luke. And Luke, being a Gentile physician, wrote to other Gentiles to explain to them who this Jewish person was and why a Jewish peasant carpenter who was killed for treason, why his life was so significant for them. And so Luke does not have many Old Testament quotes. And Luke explains a lot about Jewish things. Tells about uh, where things were located in Jerusalem. Talks a lot about why the Jews did this or that. For his target audience was Gentiles. Now with that in mind, Genealogy going all the way back to Adam for Gentiles and all the way back for Abraham to Jews. Matthew bringing primarily to the Jewish people, Luke being primarily to the Gentile people. Something that has always surprised me. I want you to think of me for a minute. There are, each one of these gospel writers chose a little account to give us something of the flavor of this wonderful birth account. Matthew records the coming of the wise men, the magi from the east. Luke records on the night of Jesus' birth the tremendous uh, preparatory message to some Judean shepherds in Bethlehem. Now think with me for a minute. Matthew records the coming of Magi. Luke records the coming of shepherds. You would think, well, Bob, that, that's exactly backwards. If Matthew, writing to Jews, is very Jewish, running in Jewish circles, trying to reach Jewish people, why would Matthew record the coming of Gentiles? And if Luke, trying to reach Gentiles... Why would he record the announcement to Jewish shepherds? You would think, logically, it would be exactly reversed, wouldn't you? That there would be Jewish shepherds to relate to Jewish people and Gentile wise men relating to Gentile people. But that's not the way the gospel put it together. And I think there's purpose here. And I want to talk briefly about that purpose. For you see, I think the gospel primarily, all four of them are very much like our gospel tracts. We might call them evangelistic tracts. It would be like the 
New Testament counterpart to our how to have a full meaningful life are the four spiritual laws. Uh, they were little bitty uh, accounts to try to bring someone who knew nothing about God, nothing about Christ, nothing about redemption, nothing about salvation, nothing about heaven or hell, try to bring them into a place to introduce them to the God of eternity, the God of heaven, the creator, redeemer, God. Every one of them is our witnessing opportunity to particular target groups. Now, if that's true, why would Matthew record Gentiles coming to Jesus? Well, first of all, I'm not 100% sure they're Gentiles. There were a lot of Jews in Babylon uh, from the exile that did not turn home. And it is possible that the Jews had become a member, some of them, of this elite group of wise men. But, kind of a, be kind of strange, Daniel was one of these groups, but of course Daniel was taken forcibly. It would be very unusual for a group of Jews to be a, a studiers of the heavens. The Jews just weren't into astral study. Because, for the most part, the study of the stars and the moon and the constellations was basically idolatry. For the Babylonians began to believe that behind all the stars and all the movements of the planets were gods. And these gods determined men's destinies. And so they gave names to all these constellations. And they watched their movement very carefully so they could know what was going to happen in the world. Now, we might call that horoscopology today. All of that began in Babylon. That's why they built those ziggurats or pyramids to get as close as they could to the heavens. Well, what in the world is a bunch of idolaters coming to the birth of a Jewish king for? And why would God speak in an unusual uh, astral way about the birth of a star for Jesus? Well, at that day and time, many people believed that great men had stars, that stars would uh, begin to shine when great men were born. Tradition all across the ancient world was that men's destinies was somehow uh, caught up in the stars. I don't think that's true. Psalms 19 tells me that the stars and the moon and the sun are simply God's handiwork for a beautiful creation. They do not control our destinies. Well, why then would God stoop down to try to uh, stir the hearts of some uh, star worshippers from a faraway country? Well, I think for several reasons. I think one reason is tell us that God loves star worshippers from faraway countries. That God cares about Gentiles. That God cares about those who don't know about His Son. That God cares about those who think they're so wise in their own estimation. But the Bible says without Christ, they're blind and wretched and naked and don't even know it. So God called three of them who were sensitive about a new star they had found. And obviously they must have been somewhat uh, knowledgeable of the Hebrew Scriptures because they say there's going to be a king born to the Jews. And they come to the land of where the Jews had always lived. And they asked the wrong person about where he was. Now, I don't know if you know King Herod. King Herod was a pretty paranoid fella. He was the kind of fella that was so... He, he was not Jewish, of course. He was from the nation of Edom. We call him an Edomian. And he was so nervous because of all the Jews could go back and, and find their lineage through generation and generation. That, and he was so jealous and, and about that that, you know, he burned all of the temple records about genealogy so nobody could know their ancestors and therefore nobody could know he wasn't really Jewish somewhere. This guy was so paranoid that he was afraid that when he died, no one would mourn him. So he uh, arrested 3,000 Pharisees, put them in prison, and told his guards, when I die, 
kill all of these Pharisees so somebody will cry at my death. Now, this was a strange fellow. Now, can you imagine him being king by the Romans, of course, over Palestine? <laughs> and here come three wise men or so and say, uh, we're looking for the king of the Jews. And you can almost hear him say, I'm the king of the Jews, right? No, is a baby king going to be born? Where is he? And here it said, first I've heard about it. <laughs> Tell me a little more about this. Now, apparently, they begin to ask the rabbis, uh, the, the scribes at court, where would the Messiah be born? Do the scriptures tell us anything about where the Messiah would be born? And, of course, the scribes knew immediately what the scriptures said about that. And they said, yes, he'll be born in Bethlehem. It comes from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Heard it so often. Now, it's exciting to me to know that those Jews knew where the Messiah was going to be born. And Herod didn't. Now, you know the account. Herod tries to trick them by saying, you go and look, and he's in this city, and you try to find him and come back and tell me, and on and on. It didn't work out. Now, I have one, I have one comment I want to make to you. I, I have been in, in, in uh, Christian's home through the years, and I've seen these beautiful nativity scenes on top of the television, right? Now, sometimes they're somewhere else, but usually on top of the television. And you got the three wise men here, and you got the, the little manger, and you got Jesus there, and you got the shepherds over here. Do you realize that we do not know there are three wise men? The song said there were three, I know, but the song is wrong. The only reason we think there are three wise men is because there's three gifts. It just is the, could have been two wise men. Could have been ten wise men. Some say, well, they're all three different colors. <laughs> oh, really? They ride camels. How do you know? We get this stuff so, so geared in our mind, we forget how much of this is tradition and how much of this is Scripture. We don't know how many wise men there, there were. We don't know how long they took to get there. We don't know what they rode. We don't know what color they are. We're not sure they, rode, they wore these robes and crowns. They're not kings. They're wise men. Now, I'm not telling you to uh, throw away your nativity scene or nothing. But I would say this to you. Maybe it's surprising. The shepherds and the wise men shouldn't be together, you know. The shepherds are going to come the night that Jesus is born. But the wise men are not going to come for two or three years. Did you know that? So if you want to really be biblical, you ought to move your wise men over onto the uh, kitchen cabinet and just point them in the direction of the manger. Because really the text itself says Jesus was a toddler when they got there. And they had moved out of a cave, apparently. And I think the, I think the nativity scene was in a cave. That's where they kept the animals. Uh, and they had moved into a home by that time. And they came to the house where Jesus was. And the word there in Greek is the toddler Jesus. And offered. Matter of fact, if, if, if they had had this money the night Jesus was born, the, the gifts the wise men bring, Mary cheated when she offered the poorest sacrifice uh, some 40 days later for, for having a baby because she offered a turtle dove. And if she'd have had all this money, she would have had to offer the more significant gift of a larger animal. So the wise men didn't come uh, for many months after Jesus was born. Matter of fact, why do you think Herod wanted all the children two years old and under killed? I mean, why? Well, because he, he wanted to know what time the star appeared, how long those guys had been traveling, and he killed all the babies. Two years old. So, here comes some Gentiles, go to the wrong fella, looking for the birth of a little king. My goodness, what a story. Pagan idolaters called by God. Took them two years to get there, no interstate. Came to find a little child. Now, to Luke, if you let me. Luke chapter 2 and 3 records the, of the very same event, seemingly, but in a little different way. And in Luke, it's shepherds. Now, you say, oh, boy, in our minds, we think of these shepherds out there, and they're laying around a campfire singing hymns to one another. And they're wonderful, wonderful believers. Shepherds were the scum of society. Did you know that? Did you know that people, Jewish people, so looked down on shepherds that they would not let a shepherd testify in a court of law? 
They didn't really want them in their uh, synagogue meetings. I'm not sure if because they smell like sheep or because they uh, couldn't keep all the Jewish rules and so they were considered unclean. You mean God not only called a group of Gentile idolaters who thought they were really wise men, but he also spoke to some Jewish shepherds who nobody would even listen to. Now, think about this. When those shepherds said, we've got something to tell you, everybody said, we don't accept your testimony. (laughs) We don't take the word of shepherds. Nobody believes shepherds. They're notorious liars. We don't accept the testimony of shepherds. And yet God came and announced the birth to shepherds. Why? So God loves outcasts. He loves those who nobody else will take their word. Loves those who aren't welcome in a worship service. He loves Gentile idolaters and he loves outcast religionists. And he didn't announce the high priest and uppity mucks in Jerusalem. (laughs) He announced to a couple of stinking shepherds out in the field the birth of the greatest king the world's ever known. It's shocking. It smashes our ornaments. It knocks down our Christmas trees. And it says that what we've made so beautiful and wonderful is really a story about love. Love that reaches in the ghettos. To winos, poor folks, stinky folks, uneducated folks, ignorant folks, outcasts, smart alecks. That's what Christmas is about, folks. It's not about turkey around the table. It's about love that's poured out for a world in need. They're gospel tracks. We can put spotlights on them and dress them up in gleaming glitter and... uh, We can put them up on altars. But the truth is, the nativity was in a stinking stable with a bunch of stinking shepherds that nobody trusted and a bunch of weirdo idolaters from hundreds of miles away came to a party, a party called by God. We've turned it into something so wonderful and neat that we go out and spend all our money on things So if somebody gives to us, we make sure we give it back to them. (laughs) We've so removed it from life that we never think that God's trying to still tell us something. That maybe the greatest Christmas gift the world has ever known is not something that's in a package, but it's an old, old story given to someone else who doesn't know about it this time of year. Maybe Satan has done Christmas. Maybe he's the one that's wrapped it up in a pretty box and made it look pretty and smell good and everybody dance around the Christmas tree. Because God didn't make it pretty. Gospels aren't a pretty story. It's about blood and guts and gore and real people and real life. And the Messiah came to outcast folks. Sick folks, leprous folks, poor folks, unreligious folks. 